This morning we continue in our series, um, and Elder Tony and Pastor Lauren are going to help me. So we're going to tag team again this morning in an effort to communicate and impart the values of the house. And we are just believing God to really go beyond our words that we as a people grab a hold of the culture in God's kingdom. We're going to cover a a few things today, and we don't have enough time to teach it to you comprehensively, but we believe Holy Spirit to just bring revelation and illumination in your heart that your spirit man grabs a hold and you're transformed and really impacted by this. So um, we are um, continuing. This is part two. This is what holds us together, the key values that we run with as a church. Again, values are different than beliefs. We might have 50 theological beliefs that we can put on paper, but only 15 of them are a core value. So it's a belief on steroids. That's a value. It's something that is non-negotiable. This is something I will die for. That's a value. And we all have values. And so it's convictions, it's non-negotiables, and these things energize us. And when we find people that will share the same value, that's power. And so Elder Tony took you to the scripture of Amos 3, verse 3. Can two people walk together without agreeing on the direction? This, if you read the passage, is God asking Israel a bunch of hypothetical, kind of obvious questions. And the answer is no. Can two people walk together without sharing the same values? Well, not for long. Because our values are are seated in our purpose, our kingdom purpose. And so you're not going to build, you're not going to have purpose. You're going to find that in a community that's headed somewhere different than the non-negotiable in your heart. And so when we share values, there's tremendous synergy, there's depth of relationship, there's kingdom productivity, and it's important, the reason of this sermon series is that we identify these things. And I'll be honest, not all of you are going to say, this is my strong point. We're going to talk about hospitality today, and that was not Tony's strong point, but God brought him up in that. So this sermon series is... Um, doing and accomplishing multiple things. And so, Holy Spirit, we pray for your work in our hearts to illuminate us, to do what only you can do, God, to position our hearts, to mend and bind our hearts together. Lord, that values are shared, that there is energy and synergy, Father, that we are passionate about what you have established in this house. And we know who we are, and we're unashamed of that. That we would stand back to back. We would defend our brother and our sister. We would not gossip or slander, but we would work as one for your glory. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen. Well, we're going to jump into the first value this morning. It is that we value living authentic lives before God and each other. Um, So... I give this scripture a lot to our youth group. It's uh, 2 Chronicles 16.9. It's not in the lineup, guys, sorry. Um, but it is. it says that the eyes of the Lord are roaming throughout the earth, seeking to show himself strong to those who are wholeheartedly devoted to him. Yeah. And the reason that this scripture is so near and dear to me is that we oftentimes find ourselves not willing to step out into uncomfortable areas, areas of weakness, Right. Areas where we're not we're not strong in in that area because I don't want to be seen as weak. I don't want to be seen as incapable. I don't want to just straight up fail. And the reality is, God asks us to step out into these areas and to just be real yeah. and and raw and vulnerable with each other. That's right. And God shows Himself through us in that way. And so, if I'm not willing to just be real with Tyler and let him see, you know, a lot of my shortcomings, and I was actually doing this yesterday, I was telling him just about, we were talking about some of how I've been not doing well in life in certain areas. Um, if I'm not willing to do that, then he doesn't see how imperfect I am and how just just weak I am, and then he can't see God shine through me and God's strength revealed through me. That's right. So we we rob God of His glory when we're not authentic. Okay. Um. I want to look at, so, so Peter, 
Um, Peter was a main source for the Gospels. Um, he was one of the main just guys that, especially in Mark, Mark went used him as a, a real resource for pulling some of the the stories throughout the Gospel of Mark. Um, what do we see throughout the Gospels? Who do we see just totally screwing up over and over again throughout the Gospels? It's Peter. Um, yeah. And I think this is a really amazing, amazing um, example of how we walk and live authentic because Peter wasn't someone who was going to, oh, you're, you're interviewing me about my time with the king of the universe. Well, let me tell you about the good stuff. No, he was like, well, this is how I messed up, and I messed up here, and I almost drowned, and Jesus caught me, and Jesus told me at one point to get behind him, Satan, and you like, he shares all of these stories about how he failed, yeah. and for the sake that others can learn from it. Um, like, he was just as real as it gets in this way. Um, so when we, um, when we are able to be value, to be, not valuable, when we're able to be authentic with each other and with God, um, it sets us up for intimacy with God because you can only be as intimate as you allow him to know you. Right. It sets us up. It allows our church family to trust us. Hmm. Um, you know, you just can't trust me if you don't know me. It, um, allows others to see potential in you. Um, and that's a big one. I mean, I, I know a lot of Tim has spoken stuff over me and drawn me up a lot of times because he just knows me. And he never would have been able to do that if I was closed off in certain areas. Yeah. Um, it allows the lost to be drawn to God. I don't know how many times I've encountered people who are outside the church and you ask them why they won't go to church. And they say, well, it's a bunch of hypocrites. That's right. It's a bunch of fake people in a church. Um, and the only way to combat that is for us to just start being real and start laying our issues out there, not in, a, not in an inappropriate way, but just this is who I am, and yet God works through me. Amen. Um, we pull up Galatians 2. This is just one example of how this works. It says, when Peter came to Antioch, this is Paul speaking, he says, I had to oppose him to his face, for what he did was very wrong. I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall. When he first arrived, he ate with the Gentile believers who were not circumcised. But afterward, when some friends of James came, Peter wouldn't eat with the Gentiles anymore. He was afraid of the criticism that he would receive. And watch what happens, watch what happens after this in verse 13. Oh, circumcision. <laughs> yes. As a result, other Jewish believers followed Peter's hypocrisy, and even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. Um, so there's a clear choice there for Peter. He started the wrong way, and he was corrected, but he started out literally leading people astray from God because he was being a hypocrite. And the opposite side of that is then when he goes and starts actually openly eating with the Gentiles, well, all of a sudden that breaks down walls. So there's, like, there's a very clear path that God lays out before us you can be a hypocrite and you're going to turn people away from me. Yeah. Or you can be totally laid out there in the open for everyone. And you're going to see walls broken down and people drawn to our God. Amen. Peter was afraid of what people thought. He was afraid of the criticism. You see that in the text? And so um, as you begin to peel this onion layer back, you begin to realize that authentic living really has to do ultimately with who are we living to please. And so we have to wrestle with the fact as a congregation that, right, God wants to use us to impact the world, right? We stop that process when we're hypocrites, when we're plastic people, or when we live for the approval of man and not of God. And so this core value of ours as a congregation, when someone walks through these doors, we want to be a people that are totally authentic and that the visitor leaves saying, those people are living for God alone. Amen. That's power. And so um, valuing authenticity means that we just put such a high premium on what God thinks. I'm living in a singular way for him. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 10, Paul says, find out what pleases the Lord. Authentic people have a purpose that is to please God. And therefore, 
as an overflow or as a byproduct, we embrace humility. We embrace authentic living because we want to please God. We're real. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 9. Again, Paul. We make it our goal to please him. Capital H. Whether we are at home in the body or away from it, at all times, in all things, I want to please the Lord. Galatians chapter 1 and verse 10, again, Paul, obviously, I'm not trying to win the approval of people, but of God. If pleasing people were my goal, I would not be Christ's servant. And so people pleasing is a dangerous trap that churches and Christians fall into. We are oftentimes motivated by what people think of us, and we begin to put on a fake front, begin to act as something that I'm not. We want to hide our weaknesses. We want to exaggerate our strengths. We want to self-protect. We want to look holy. We want to look spiritual. We want to look like we have it all together. And so we fall to this temptation. We hide our insecurities. We begin to play a part. We begin to be two-faced. We begin to try to act something that we're not. And the result is that we keep people at a distance. We don't let them into our space. We avoid situations that might expose me, that might reveal who I really am. That, oh my gosh, I might not be as spiritual as I looked on Sunday morning. And so now we're doing a dance. And we're having to uphold this hypocrisy. People are at a distance. And when we do this, we're unable to carry one another's burdens. We're unable to be the body of Christ as he intended And so Galatians 6 and verse 2 completely falls short. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. When we don't live authentic, it means we're not connecting. We're not able to carry one another's burdens. And it means that the ministry that God wants to do one to another cannot happen in the body of Christ. It means we will not attend life groups. It means we will not engage in one-on-one discipleship because I don't want people in my space. Right? And that is contrary to God's kingdom. I am not casting stones at you, but I want to bring to the light the culture of God's kingdom is that we are authentic, that we are real. In our brokenness and all, here's the package. Here I am. What did Paul say? I am who I am by the grace of God. Living authentic is so key to the kingdom, and it is absolutely foundational to spiritual growth. If you begin to be plastic, you stop growing. When you begin to put on hypocrisy and a two-faced lifestyle, it all stops. Because now you become the center and not God. God resists who? The The proud. God also resists the hypocrite. It's an extension of pride. How many times have believers, you know, the first part in backsliding is thinking you have it all together, not living authentic. I'm fine. How are you, brother? I'm fine. I'm good. And sin is festering in their life. When we're not authentic, we don't let people in, and we begin to get on the slide of compromise, and we find ourselves Sliding right out of God's grace, right out of the church. God cannot work in Lone Ranger Christians that have walls built up and refuse to let the community of God in. A key culture, a key element of the kingdom culture is that we're authentic and we let people in. Colossians 1 and verse 10, this is Paul's prayer over the, the Colossians, he said that I pray that you would live a life worthy of the Lord, please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, pleasing him, pleasing him. We must be a people that live authentic in order that God might be pleased and that he might do his work in us. All right, so let's talk a second about how humility plays into this. Um, two scriptures. So first James 5:16, it's confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. Um, I obviously need to be able to be humble enough to 
to bring sins and confessions before someone and get their prayer. One other scripture we're going to look at in, in relation to this, Luke 18. So two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other was a despised tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed this prayer. I thank you, God, that I am not like other people, cheaters, sinners, adulterers. I'm certainly not like that tax collector. I fast twice a week and I give you a tenth of my income. But the tax collector stood at a distance and dared not even lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. Instead, he beat his chest in sorrow, saying, O oh God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. I tell you that this sinner, not the Pharisee, returned home justified before God. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. So the crux of the gospel in salvation is that I come before God and acknowledge, God, I'm not enough. In fact, I'm filthy, and I need you. I need you to cleanse me. I need you to pick me up out of the miry pit and set me on a rock. Amen. I need you to give me eternal life and I, I have no hope outside of you. So that is, that is like the core of the gospel and salvation, and how could we think that we just move past that? So when it comes to just growing in God, um, we get so stuck in the mud sometimes because I'm not willing to just acknowledge within my own heart and before God, you know what? I'm in sin right now, or I have a hard heart, or I need to adjust this. You know, I need to become more hospitable, or I need to stop talking to this person this way, or I need to start going to life group, or whatever it is. We're not willing to acknowledge that within our own hearts. We're not willing to come humbly before God with that, and all of a sudden, our spiritual growth just gets halted right there. And so, a lot of us in this room probably are at a place where we're not experiencing the spiritual growth we could be, because I'm not just being humble and authentic before God in, in, in certain areas because there's darkness in my heart that's not available to God. Yeah. And then with each other, um, I obviously need to be able to be real and humble before someone if I've done them wrong, just, just for the sake of there being unity there and, and forgiveness between us. Um, but even outside of that, I... Uh, I think so often, even just going back to the Peter thing, God uses our stories, right? Well, how much more powerful is it if someone can watch me walk through my testimony? Yeah. And, you know, a lot, a lot of times we never get to see that because someone will, someone will hide what they're going through and hide what they're going through and hide what they're going through. And one day, five years down the road, they come out the other side and they're like, hey, look at my testimony I walked through. Yeah. And nobody watched it because they hid it along the way. I, I can tell you that I've I've watched I've watched certain people walk through some of the most difficult times of their lives and I've watched them be open with it. Not in a pity me way, but just in a well this is me. And I have been impacted in such crazy ways just through watching people walk out their testimony. Um Trent is Trent Bowman is probably the, the best example I there you are. Best example I know of this, honestly. When I met Trent a couple years ago, I mean, we would talk about on a weekly basis just about what we were going through, and I've never met anyone more honest and open about, like, hey, I'm coming short in this area. I'm working in this area. Like, I'm, I'm not up to God's standard in this area, and I, wa I have watched him for the last several years just continue to grow and grow and grow and and just begin to purify his life and step into what God's called him to. Um, and so we all see Trent thriving today. Um, a lot of us got the, the pleasure and joy of watching him just be real along the journey. Um, and that is like so blessed my heart and and encouraged me and, and just given me even hope in my own life um, as I go through stuff to be able to have like have watched Trent go through that. Um, so if, if I'm not willing to just be real along the journey with you guys, um, I'm robbing you from, from what God wants to do in your own hearts. Yeah, God poured out grace in Trent because he was humble. God gives grace to those that walk in humility. And so as we wrap this value up, um, this hits home for all of us. It's tough. 
to be open and real. But this is our culture. This is who we are. Our marriages aren't going to fail because we're going to get help. We're going to be authentic and say we're struggling. Yeah. Right? We're going to be open and honest. It's the ask and, or it's instead of the, uh, the, yeah, it's the ask and tell. Uh, no, no, I'm all tripping over my words right now. Instead of the ask and tell culture with the, like, the, the secrets in our heart, it's the culture of I'm going to tell it. I'm going to initiate it. I'm going to be open and real. I'm struggling. I'm struggling with pornography. I'm struggling with this. I'm struggling with, with that addiction. I want to be open and honest and authentic. This is what is the foundation of discipleship, of life groups, of living life together. That's our hashtag. The reason for that is we value it and we see God's grace poured out when we are authentic, when we're open. Guys, this is not about finger pointing to other churches, but look at church as a whole. There's so many plastic people, hypocrites. We at Abundant Harvest are not above that. There's plastic people in here. We face this battle. Satan wants you to be plastic. He wants you to come in here with a wall build up. He wants you to keep everyone at an arm's distance. He doesn't want you to be open about anything. So hear this value and see it as something that God is doing in us. This is something we are committed to fighting for. We don't want to be fake. And how many of you know the world can smell a fake Christian a mile away. God, make us truly the salt and the light of the world. Let us be authentic and real. We don't have it all together. I don't need to perform. Don't put me on a pedestal. I'm not perfect. Let's be authentic. Let's be real. And this is freedom. Amen. So this is something we're fighting for. It's a, it's a non-negotiable DNA of the house. The second value, Pastor Lauren's going to help me with this one, um, just to really impart to you guys some practical stuff. Value number two for today, we value living hospitable lives that welcome people in our homes, into our space. It's kind of a, a um, piggyback to living authentic. Hospitality is partly a personality thing, but let me just tell you, it's a kingdom thing. Hospitality springs from the heart of God. Hospitality is the opposite, opposite of the flesh and of self. Because it gives of self, it sacrifices self, and it welcomes others in. Our default as sinful people is to keep our walls built up. Christ moves in, we die to flesh... And then we begin to have a new love for the world and we're willing to bring people into our space. So I want to read some scriptures to you that you're able to see the, um, really, the heartbeat of God, the value of hospitality in the scripture. Romans 12 and verse 13. When God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. This is, again, an overflow of his spirit in us, motivating us to bring people in, to show them God's love. 1 Peter 4 and verse 9, cheerfully share your home with those who need a meal or a place to stay. Hebrews 13 and verse 2, don't forget to show hospitality to strangers, for some of you have done this, have entertained angels without even realizing it. So I began to write these scriptures down. I began to think about how Satan is warping American culture. Do you realize we're scared of each other? We might be an American citizen. We're scared of each other. We don't trust in another American. Who knows what they might do? We don't let them in our, on our property. We don't let them in our space. Scripture says to let them sleep in our house. Look at how... I think it's because we watch too many murder shows. <laughs> Look at how America. Satan is doing such a good job of driving wedges in and injecting fear in the people of God that we will no longer have this hospitality overflow in our lives. And so, interesting enough, hospitality is given as a requirement for elders twice. 1 Timothy 3... And then in Titus chapter 1 and verse 8, you see it on the screen, rather an elder must enjoy having guests in his home. Hospitality is a big deal to God. Leaders in the kingdom need to be hospitable. We must be willing to let you in. You need to be able to come into our home. 
And so um, I want you to understand you can have a level of hospitality without using your home. But the true definition, the height of hospitality, how we use the word here is about the house. Because we believe from scripture, hospitality is opening our home wide and bringing people in as an overflow. So um, hear me, you can be hospitable, but I believe God's calling you, stretching you to be willing to use your house as a place of ministry. The power of our home cannot be missed, church. When I take you out for a meal, that blesses you. When you sit at my kitchen table, you're ministered to. Big difference. The power of the home. And so we might have insecurities. There might be all kinds of things going on in our hearts. Let Holy Spirit work us through that. Let's become a hospitable people where we begin to break bread house to house. Let's realize God's called us to a level of hospitality that it might not even be on our radar, but it's on God's because it's a key part of his kingdom. You, again, may have grown up as a child that you never saw mom and dad with people in your house. This might be like totally foreign to you, but as a part of God's body, as a way of reaching the world, as Um, A child of God, God expects us to use our homes as a place of ministry. Not just to feed people, not just to give them a bed to sleep in, but a place that says, you're valuable and I'll bring you in my space. What's this thing that Americans have come up with that you're in my space? (laughs) You're in my space, dude. You're too close. Get out of my space. That's from hell. Let people in your space. It's okay. It's okay. We have a renewing of our mind that we need. We really need to be renewed. Now, I'm not saying again to open up your street, your home to just any guy in the street. Listen to me. Wisdom. Holy Spirit led. Are you saying I have to let the kids in my space when I'm in the bathroom? Because that is that like a level of hospitality that we're parents are required to walk in? Yeah, no, that just happens anyway, whether it's hospitality or not, right? It happens. I want to go back to, are you done? Sure. Okay. <laughs> I want to go back to Romans 12. I just want to point out in these two verses, Romans 12, 13 and 1 Peter 4, 9, I think that the key word that like hit me just now when we read this is always be eager. How many of us are eager to show hospitality? Not very many. Go to 1 Peter 4, 9 cheerfully share your home. Look at these descriptives, eagerness, cheerfully. What does that show? It shows it's also an attitude of your heart, right? It's a heart attitude. This hospitality really is a heart issue that plays out practically in the home. And ultimately, hospitality, the look of hospitality is this. It's standing with arms wide open and saying, welcome. You are welcome. It's a posture, a heart posture. Um, I just want to give, I'm going to give some of the nuts and bolts of hospitality, but I, I do want to just clarify with this statement. There are seasons, guys, when, when hospitality happens less, sure. okay? Th- that's just a practical outflow. Um, taking care of sick relatives, having having little kids in the house, sometimes it's a lot harder due to hospitality. There's a lot of things that, that limit hospitality, but that doesn't mean that it's not a key part of what who God's called us to be, and that it needs to be an eagerness about us, a cheerfulness yeah. about us where we're postured with arms wide open. Really, hospitality is just an extension of living authentic, mm-hmm. right? Anybody who knows that come to my home frequently enough, um, you'll see that I ha- live authentically in an authentic house. <laughs> that I do like to put on the dog sometimes, right? I do, I do enjoy a good party and a really ritzy party at that. But anybody else who's come for our small groups knows that frequently what you'll see is six loads of laundry on my bedroom and a naked child running around the house wet somewhere, right? <laughs> so there is an element of, of just realness, real living, authentic living when you come to our house because it's not about putting on a show. It's about relationship, Hospitality is all about relationship. That is the key component of hospitality. Building a relationship, being real. 
Whether a little bit or a lot is had, relationship is what is offered, not a show. So whether you have a little bit, whether you have a small house or a large house, whether you have very little to your name or you have a lot to name, what, what you offer to me whenever you're being hospitable is not what you have. It's your relationship. It's who right. you are. And so um, that's just a very important understanding of hospitality. We value people and their presence more than cleanliness or a big spread. And you know, we, Tim and I oftentimes say this, if you're a small group leader, you've heard us say this in trainings, but the best conversations happen after 10 p.m. Okay, why is that? It's so annoying sometimes. <laughs> why is that? Well, because the longer people are at your house, the later that they're ha you're at the house, the more their guard comes down and who they really are comes out. Right. And so when we as, as people have a time clock and we're like, oh, 7.45, got to push you out the door, got to get going, we are missing out on what God wants to do oftentimes because of the extent of relationship. Haven't you been at my house until about 11.30, midnight? Yeah, but that's whenever, he doesn't, he doesn't open up until about 10.45, so and then we have to work on it, right? So this happens frequently, and this is just normal, Okay. And so we have to, we should have this expectation and we should want to do it cheerfully because it's about the relationship. Right. It's not about putting on a show or a time clock. Um, oftentimes when I have a group of people coming over or I have a, a couple coming over or anything, um, this is just a really practical thing. I ask myself, how do I get this specific group from point A to point B? Um, and I use that with food, games, questions, topics. I make decisions for what and how to do um, from how I move them from this point to this point. If I'm hosting primarily just for fellowship, uh, I assess the depth of the relationship already present. So if I have Tony and Kenzie over to my house, we have a very, very deep relationship. I don't have to do hardly anything. It just flows out. We end up having deep conversation. It's good. If I would have Sandy, for instance, I don't know Sandy as well. I would be a lot more strategic in how can I be intentional to get to her heart? And so as hosts, as people of God, make be intentional to get to people's hearts by asking key questions, by um, doing things that, that cause people to go from a shallow place to a deep place. A depth of relationship or a deep relationship does not happen by accident. It doesn't. Right. And so there has to be some, some proactive intentionality when building relationship and being hospitable. Some practical elements of hosting. Um, so having a relaxed environment but not uncomfortable or chaotic is really important. If I'm in a house where everything is white and I bring my children over, I am definitely not going to be very, very comfortable. Now, there are some parents that choose that and more power to you, but I, am, I, I, like, I, would, I would struggle with that. If everything's white, perfect, and clean, I will struggle a lot more being comfortable in your space <laughs> than, than if I was just, if there was to be like a footprint on the floor or you know brown furniture, which is what mine is in my house on purpose. <laughs> 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 yeah, if it was white, it would not be brown either. Or it would be brown anyway. Um, fellowship around food. Fellowship around food is really important. So when we were, oh, I internship, um, oh my gosh, it's been a long time since we graduated. I internshiped with a pastor in, um, in New York City. And we stayed with him and his wife. And they were Italian. So enough said, right? Italians are great with hospitality and they're great with food and they just know how to put on the dog and they know how to just be loving. But we would sit at their kitchen table up until, I don't know, late into the night and every 10 minutes, more food would be brought out and stuck in front of us and then we would sit there and eat it and then more food would be brought out and then we'd sit there and eat it. And what was interesting about it is that that perpetuated conversation, it, it allowed them, me to know, hey, we're not pushing you away. We're not telling you you have to go. Here's more. Stay longer. Come and join us. Have be a part. And so Pastor Dan and Vanjie, he's passed away now. What a wonderful couple. But that will be something that always sticks in my mind. Honor your guests when you bring them into your home. Cooking favorite foods or having special meals. Um, check dietary concerns. There's a lot of that stuff going on right now. You can just show a lot of honor to people by asking simple questions before they come. 
um, having people in the home. Our mantra is, your home is your greatest place of ministry. Things are shared around the dinner table, in your living room, or around a campfire that will never come out in this building. That's right. <laughs> Period. Um, if you are, just a, this is just a practical thing. I'm just kind of giving you some practical things. If you're really particular about cleaning, um, we used to have some friends that whenever we would, we would come over, there was an urgency as soon as, we, as soon as they were done with dinner to like clean up. Like, okay, we got to get this cleaned up right away. Um, that's always really difficult in extending a comfortableness around people. What I recommend in situations like that is just get paper products. Okay, just make it easier on yourself. If you're concerned about cleaning up, don't spend a ton of time cleaning because you want to because you have a, a desire to be clean. Understand that it's about the relationship. So save yourself some time, get paper products, throw them away, and then your kitchen's clean. It's wonderful. Case in point. There's a lot of solutions to things that people bring. A lot of people bring excuses because their heart's not naturally postured that way. Or they, or it's a not a natural. It's a it's a nat, it's a struggle for them, not a natural outflow. And so, if you have a specific question, I'm not saying I'm the queen of hospitality, but I have a lot of a lot of tricks and things and ideas. So if you have a specific question, come talk to me. If you're bad with snacks and meals, come up with two or three snacks and meals. Anybody who comes to our house for premarital counseling knows that what's put on the table, pistachios. You have pistachios whenever you come for premarital counseling because when you're sitting there and you don't want to talk about things, at least you can look at what's on your fingers, right? Um, and it's, it's, something, it's something that kind of enables people to, to continue. Um, have, some, have just some really specific things. In this case, instead of cooking for dietary restrictions, just tell people, hey, this is what I, this is what I always make whenever we do this. I'm sorry if I can't help you. Um, I don't have kids. That's a one that a one that a lot of people say. Well, I don't have kids, so I can't have families with kids. Okay, so one kid, people don't have issues, especially whenever they're like this and they can't run around. When they're my children, people that are not used to kids don't know how to handle them. But I will say this, and I'm probably gonna embarrass them a little bit, but Chuck and Judy have blessed me in the past significantly with this. Chuck and Judy have not had little kids around for a long time. And yet they have kept a, a basket full of stuff there that they keep and they pull out for whenever the kids are over. And they have, they have the heart of hospitality. They have us over. Chuck makes a wonderful meal. He always does, deal, deals with my, my dietary restrictions and is concerning of that. And we get to go over in a couple of weeks, which I'm super excited. But then they have toys for the kids. They show interest in the kids. And it is an all-around welcoming thing. And the relationship is the key. They don't, they don't worry about putting on some big show, but they just want to be real and they want to live authentic. And I love it. So thank you, Chuck and Judy. Um, just another practical thing. Be aware of allergens and scents. This is a huge thing. Know when to put TV and music on. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Growing up in my house... The TV was always on, always, in my grandparents' house, always on. And it was always playing in the background. And I'll tell you what, that is something that I'm very aware of when I have guests over. Like, if there's too much noise, it goes off. And I, so just be aware that sometimes those sensory things can really be good. And ultimately, having the TV on does not really honor people most of the time. So if it's just in the background, um, be aware of that. And that was, by the way, my mom's not here, but that was not my mom's doing. <laughs> She's watching online. Um, so I would just I just want to conclude with this by saying a couple enemies of hospitality is comparison. My house is not like Pastor Tim and Lauren's. My house is not like Dave and or oh my gosh, George and Sherry's. Um, my my house is not like whoever, X, Y, and Z. Okay. Don't go there. Just don't go there. Your house is your house. And relationship is what people want. That's right. That's what they want. And that's what's important. Wounds and family history. There's a, many reasons why people don't want to do this. But the heart of the father is arms wide open. And so we overcome these insecurities. We overcome these struggles because the heart of the father is arms wide open. Fear of judgment. A lot of people... Um, I've known quite a few parents that are like, if you come in my space and see how I parent my kids, you're going to judge how I parent my kids. 
these are just real things and I'm not, I'm not giving you solutions for how to get around them. I'm just calling them out and saying, don't live under these. Yeah. And finally, selfishness and being full of self is the biggest enemy to hospitality. Selfishness will always keep you to you and your family to your family. When I was growing up, um, there were times where that were off limits for other people that um, now I understand you have to fo create a form of identity and family components and things like that. But there were times when like, I remember my dad being really selfish with, this is my family. This is my family time. Nobody's allowed in. And that really in a lot of ways caused us as a family to not be hospitable. And so I just want to challenge you, ask yourself those questions. Am I comparing? Am I wounded? Am I fearing what other people are going to think? And am I selfish that I ultimately keep from standing arms wide open? So the reason we asked, uh, I asked Lauren to share with you is because she's a good mom. And a lot of you have spent time in our house and you feel comfortable. We're real. There's dirty dishes in the sink. And half the time we forget to offer you water and you just go get it out of the cup, out of the, you know, out of the, the, the uh, cupboard. And you're just, we, we live this. And so I wanted you to hear Lauren just spit out a bunch of practicals that go on in, in her mind. You can draw from that later. Here's what I want to pull you back to. Hospitality is a key value in the kingdom of God. And we as a people are called to be hospitable, to open wide our hearts and to let people in. The older connect with the younger through hospitality. We open wide our hearts at the table. We break bread. The early church met house to house and has not stopped doing so since. Hospitality, guys, is going to pave the way for reaching this generation where we're real and we open wide our homes. Our world is broken. You know how many broken homes are out there? Invite them in to your home, in your brokenness, in your lack, but there's Christ there. Amen? So hospitality is really something that is hard. It's a challenge. Let's acknowledge that. But let's see the Father heart of God in here and realize he's calling us to overcome our selfishness, these challenges, these obstacles, let down and let people in. Final value, I'm giving this to you by myself. Final value today, we value intentional engagement in our community. I believe key in the kingdom foundational value in the kingdom is that we are engaged out there. This is a passion of mine. One of the reasons I still work part-time in the community at Heller's is because of this value. I do not want to be a pastor that goes into the black hole of the church. I want to remain engaged with the community. Right. And so I believe this is God's heart, that we as a church don't just run around over here in this little subgroup where we only just hang out with Christians. One of our values is we rub shoulders. We're passionate about our community. We love our community. We serve our community. We're engaged with the community. And so it comes from this concept that God's placed you right where you are. Acts chapter 17, Paul makes a very profound statement. He says, from one man, he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. He marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. I want you to understand that God marked out the appointed time for each man to live. Depending on your translation, this verse is translated different ways. He determined the exact time that they should live. God has dropped you in Duncanon in 2023, whatever your address might be, God's placed you there. He determined your mama and your dad, you were born here. You were born, placed, married. You're here. God has established that. You're in community. You make up the Perry County community. It's in God's heart that we are engaged in that as his church. Community's a big deal to him. And I want you to Again, step back and look at the attack of Satan. Satan has so barraged the church from every angle. He has pushed us into a corner where we just kind of come in here and hide. We just kind of do our little thing on Sunday mornings. We struggle to be loud for Jesus on Monday morning. We've just been pushed back into doing a little churchy thing and being a little subculture over here. That is not the intention of God. 
We are to be the president, the senators, those on the school board, those that are township supervisors. We, the people of God, with the revelation of God, are to be engaged and an integral part in our community that the principles and the blessing of God might flow. Amen. Satan has so attacked the church, he has driven us back into this corner do you realize it's no longer considered a holy thing, an honoring thing, a God thing to run for office, be involved in community? We have been so bombarded. And even in church cultures, we say, that's a secular thing. We need our minds renewed. We need this value to be rebuilt in the kingdom of God. We are the church. We take the ground for Jesus. We run for office. I've heard again and again how many people are so frustrated to throw up their hands. I can't take this wokeness. Can't take this. I'm just going to back out. Let that to somebody else. Church! That's what Satan wants. Yeah, come on. Right. We value community and we are committed to it. It's a core value. We will run for school board. We will stand up against woke agenda. We will push back. We will not just have a woe is me mentality. We have biblical hope. We believe for victory. We believe for transformation, for revival. That it is possible for a culture to turn back to God. And so we recognize God has called us to engage in our culture. We don't just throw up our hands. We volunteer. We run for office. We engage ourselves. We value Business. Guys, I'm super passionate about business. Business in the local community. We're, we engage the community. God, give us business ideas. Yeah. Place Christian business men and women in positions of influence. I want you to just imagine with me. I work at Heller's. God's got at least a man at Heller's. Steve's at Heller's. We've got Adam over here in Landisburg. Sandy's in Newport at the daycare. Brenda, she's in Newport at Carpetbaggers. Art's down here on Main Street. The list goes on. Engaged. I don't have my bouncy balls here. You guys remember the bouncy balls? People hit rock bottom and God needs people to catch them. If we pull back from community... If we disengage, if we have a woe is me, then God doesn't have his frontline army that's out there passionate about rubbing shoulders with the unsaved. We need a kingdom understanding that church is not some little subculture that just happens over here. This is the smallest thing that we do. The real thing happens the other six days a week where we get to be the church. We leave here and we enter our mission field. We enter the place that God's going to use us. It's out there we lay our hands on the sick. Amen. Yeah. We need a value shift in our heart. It is a holy calling. It is a valuable thing to give of our time, to be engaged in the community. We do run for office, places of influence. We don't throw up our hands. God has called us. To be the light of the world. And so we have the principles. We have the truth. We have the revelation that would allow the community to prosper. And so we engage in the community. We say, yes, God. Lead us into the community to be your hands and feet. Mark chapter 10 and verse 45 as we wrap it up. Jesus again, our example, came not to be served but to serve others. To give his life as a ransom for many. Guys, serving the world is an extension of Christ. And we do it in community. We do it in Duncannon. We do it in the soup kitchens. We do it in our office. Adam, we do it when we're babysitting kids. We do it when we're serving them in carpet baggers. We do it at Heller's. We serve. How many times do people come up to me and say, there's just something different about you? Let me tell you. It's Jesus. I'm willing to take customer service to the next level. Why? 
because of the service of Christ. I'm not in it for a paycheck. I'm in it to impact a life. Community. We value people. We value community involvement, and we see a direct connection to that and our life of serving Christ, selflessly giving ourselves. So today, guys, you've heard three values. It's been long. It's been a lot. The Holy Spirit is speaking. One statement, one word has brought conviction and challenge to your heart to grow in the area of being authentic, to be open, to be real. May the Lord bless that. Father, grow us in being real and authentic. Hospitality. Man, this one's like right in our face. We struggle with this. Can I vision for you? I so want, in a weird way, for visitors to come to this church and us to be a church that very quickly invites them to their house. Not like we to them, but them to us. I want us to open wide our hearts and show just authenticity, the love of Christ. Be hospitable. Let God move. One another's in scripture. Lord, let it happen. Grow us in hospitality, Father. Grow us in these things. And finally, guys, when it comes to community, do not see yourself as backed in the corner. Woe is me. Everything's just going down the drain. It is, but it's going to keep going down the drain if you just stay over here in this little subculture. Get out of this box and realize God is calling you to engage in community. Love people. Be loud about Christ. Core values in the kingdom. We've got growth. We we need to grow in some of this, but Holy Spirit's going to show us and lead us in that.